Um, so, so I guess we'll go ahead and start. Looks like we have a good group. Um, welcome everyone. I am taking over this role that um, for the planning office, um, at least for an interim basis um, and um, chairing this committee. So you'll have to bear with me since I have uh, some of the, uh, many of you I know well and others I don't know. And if I trip up here, just let me know that I'm going down the wrong path. Um, but hopefully we can figure everything out. I'm also just want to warn you that I have, um, I'm getting signals that which was not happening before. So I don't know what's going on, but I've made Chris um, a co-host. So if anything happens, um, Chris, um, um, you'll have to pick up the reins there for me, I think. Gotcha. Um, okay, great. So you All cut right. out there a little bit, Carolyn. I think that's what you were trying to tell us that you were cutting out. <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so as you heard entering into the room, this meeting's being recorded. Um, and we start out with public comment. Is there any public comment um, before we start on the regular agenda items? Jackie, do you have your hand raised? Or no, that's my cursor. Never mind. <laughs> I, I will have some comments uh, later in the meeting about sp some specific items, but um, I'd, I'd prefer to hold those comments. Yeah, and it, this would be for anything that's not otherwise on the agenda. So if it's on the agenda, then we'll get to it at that point in the meeting. So I'm not seeing anybody. So I guess we'll just go into the approval of, um, of the minutes, review and approval. Does anybody have any comment about the minutes? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Was that Chris? No, it's Ben. ben. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Rachel and Ben, right? Okay. The lead's contingent. <laughs> Great. So um, uh, there's a motion and a second. All in favor? I guess um, you do roll call on these, yeah. is that right? Okay, yeah. so uh, Ben Weil, I'm just gonna go down my list. Yes. Uh, Rachel Maori. Yes. Um, Louis Hasbrook. Abstain, I wasn't at the meeting. Do you wanna still accept them or no? Just sure, abstain? yes, no, okay. I'll, I'll accept them. Okay. Um, Rich Parcelletti? Yes. And well, um, oh, Gordon Meadows? Yes. Okay. And I think that covers it. Chris Mason, sorry. No, I don't vote. Oh, non voting, right. Non voting. Okay. okay, so it sounds like that passed. <laughs> Thank you. Want me to take the next one, Carolyn? Sure, that would be great. Sure, just want to present uh, Stephanie uh, Chicarillo from Amherst Sustainability Coordinator. Um, uh, as you know, I've been working with the cohort on um, uh, building energy disclosure and Stephanie presented at the last meeting. Um, I was impressed with what they were doing in Amherst. You guys have asked specifically to hear what other communities are doing. And so it was a shoe in, it was a fit. And Stephanie's, um, Happy to share with what they're doing. In this case, it's efforts to establish a rental unit efficiency rating, right? But with that, I'll let you, I'll let Stephanie take over. Thank you right. for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everybody. So nice to meet you. Um, so I am the sustainability coordinator for the town of Amherst and also the staff liaison to our energy and climate action committee. And so uh, a subcommittee of that group has been meeting um, for several years now, actually, um, with the Rocky Mountain Institute's effort 
to um, accelerate building electrification in the state of Massachusetts. And as you know, there's been obviously a lot of legislation, things happening recently, but um, but one of the efforts that sprung out of that was that we worked with a coach, a community coach, um, to sort of focus on something that we wanted to do that would help us sort of move some kind of effort forward. And we were really stuck on the idea of um, the fact that 40% of our housing stock is really, you know, what is the main, um, other than the universities and colleges, you know, the main contributors to, um, to our greenhouse gas emissions. So looking at that stationary building stock, we sort of thought, well, how can we move efficiency forward? What are the things that we, you know, have to do that, you know, make it a requirement? Because as you all know, it's one thing to work and deal with your municipal building stock, but there's not a lot we can do in the public, you know, residential sector. So there is a, a pathway that that our committee saw. And there's a rental registration bylaw that exists in Amherst where all um, owners of rental units have to register their buildings, they pay a fee, they register their buildings. Um, and it that information is collected and then we have um, inspectors who actually go and it gives them the ability to check on rental issues um, and that kind of thing. So we have a new form of government. We now have um, a town council instead of town meeting, and we no longer have a select board. Town council fulfills uh, the role of, of, of the, um, the select board with the town manager. And so they are looking at all of our policies very closely. So they took the the rental registration bylaw, and they've been examining it. And the ECAC saw this as an opportunity to insert some kind of requirement for building efficiency within the rental registration checklist. So when they were going through the whole list of things that they look for in the rent rental registration bylaw, this came up as literally one tiny little checkpoint item. So it's just one thing that the committee wants to insert to say, well, efficiency should be looked at when the when the inspectors are doing walkthroughs of rental units um, for compliance there should be something about energy efficiency as part of that checklist so that that was sort of one of the approaches um, but certainly one of the pathways that was afforded to the committee to have some kind of influence so the committee has talked about it um, this sort of subgroup has done a lot of research and there are kind of two approaches that um, each kind of have a lot of possibilities, but two main approaches. So the first one would be for building owners to provide information on their rental properties as just part of this annual permitting review process or permitting process. And that would be things like, you know, basic building information, like the year it's built, the square footage, because although we have some data within our, um, our database, our assessor's database, we don't have everything that we need. And it's not in one convenient package. So you have to kind of dig around and it would be really hard. It's not even easy for us to generate reports. Like this is one of those things as staff where it's, it was kind of nice that it happened this way because it, it really helps people understand that when people say things to us like, well, can't we, can we just have a list of the rental units and their square footage? <laughs> so we say, sure. And then we go to our IT, depart IT department and they, I cannot tell you how long it took them to try to come up with some kind of list with all of the requirements that they were looking for. Um, it just wasn't that easy to compile one big central database of information. So this would be one way to start getting that information to make sure that it can it can be actually um, put into a convenient convenient access. Um, so that's kind of one pathway. The other pathway is for independent inspections. And that would be something where town staff would be more directly involved. So when our inspectors go to a, uh, a unit, they would have a checklist perhaps that um, that they would, you know, either have the, um, you know, have, you know, have ahead of time that would be a requirement to sort of check off and they'd probably have to work more directly with the, with the property owner, but there would be, um, 
you know, maybe rating systems like HERS or um, AGS or BEAS or, you know, these other existing rating scores that could somehow be utilized so that, you know, these rental units have a, have a identification, you know, energy efficiency means of identification. So those are kind of the main pathways. Um, and I would say that we're not we're not at a place where we, we're implementing this tomorrow. <laughs> you know, this is a really, it's been a lot of work trying to get this information. It's been a lot of work trying to sort of figure out the pathways. And at this point now it's um, the town council, um, our subcommittee of the town council is meeting and discussing this um, rental registration bylaw. So they're basically looking for our committee to sort of come up with the proposal which I'm encouraging them to do as well, you know, it really makes sense for this to be a role for them where they say, okay, this is the way we think you should go and that they would sort of then propose that and then the council would review it and decide if that's the way they want to go. So it's really sort of these two main pathways, whether it's kind of something that, you know, landlords just self-report or staff has some kind of a rating system that's um, that's kind of a requirement that's across the board and landlords have to comply with the rating system or you know the the inspectors have a checklist and they sort of check off as they go um, so that's kind of the main the main things that we're covering I mean there's lots of you know within those pathways there's other you know potential scenarios but and uh, Steve unfortunately um, Steve Roof, who is the Energy and Climate Action Committee member who's been spearheading this is actually traveling for work right now. Otherwise, he would really be the one who would be speaking to you. I'm I'm involved in this effort, but Steve is the one more directly kind of spearheading this. So um, I know he has notes and I know he'd be more than happy to speak to you some other time or if you wanted to follow up with him directly. Oh, Chris, you're muted. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we have a question from Gordon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, are there incentives that Amherst has been considering to help to, for landlords to make their units more efficient? And I ask because it sounds like a significant undertaking to get everyone's properties registered and to start to get a database compiled of all of the basic information. It sounds like it would take several years, even if you plowed ahead full speed. And I wonder, um, you know, what is the purpose beyond having data? I think we need to start thinking past just knowing what's going on and towards what can we be doing as a municipality to encourage greater levels of energy efficiency within this building sector. Um, and so I just want to make sure that that's something that we as a city are considering. Uh, what's the next step? You know, what is the purpose of collecting this data? And then what are we going to actually do to make a change because it's a lot of effort to just know what's going on. Um, if I could respond. Um, so the rental registration bylaw already exists and there's already a program in place and that's been actually a source of revenue for the town because the landlords have to register their um, their rental units and of a certain size, there's a threshold, um, but they have to they have to register their units and um, they have to they have to comply with the registration. And if they don't report, um, then they potentially face being fined. So it's not um, it's not an overwhelming burdensome amount, but it is some revenue for the town because we do have significant rental in the town, uh, rental units in the town. So that exists, that database of the rental units already exists. What we're but looking- that doesn't exist for us here in Northampton. Oh, no, 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 I'm not saying you, I, I'm not saying you, and I understand that you were talking about Northampton. Right. I just wanted to you to understand that, like this is kind of a multi-stage 
mm -hmm. process. So we had this yeah. rental registration initiative first, and mm -hmm. this piece is like an added piece to that to get more data and to sort of try to centralize it. So that's all I'm really getting to, mm -hmm. that it's okay. been a multi, multi-level layered effort. It's not all happening yeah. overnight. How long has it taken for, for Amherst to build this database? How long have you been working on it? It's been several years now. I would, I, off the top of my head, I mean, I've, I would say it's probably been in existence. I want to say around eight years, maybe. It's mm, it's gone so back some. a while. Yeah, it's quite some time. So this is like a, again, it's a new. This is something like it's a it's a. You know, we've already got this database of information. We've got like the basic information that we need, but we, you know, we need sort of more detailed information. And the reason why we want to do it mm -hmm. is because we want to incentivize landlords to um, either improve the efficiency of their existing units, mm -hmm. or we want to encourage, you know, uh, new construction to be more efficient. So that's kind of the, and, and so for it, rental. That, that does get to my question, how? how are you going to incentivize that yes <laughs> and that's a million dollar question <laughs> so um you know we don't we don't really know like there may be one of the things we're looking at is things like a heat pump program where the incentive might go to the landlord um to provide some funding to cover the installation of the heat pumps mm -hmm. um you know but but again that's i know that our our housing um, trust is investigating that pathway, but the mm -hmm. town is as well. And I think mm -hmm. they're looking at, at it more from the, the housing trust side, from the building ownership yeah. side, we're looking at it more as a way to support renters, the town's program, potential program. So we're kind of investigating options. We, you know, we don't know either. We're probably similar to you trying to sort of sort through this whole you know issue of how do we how do we you know get construction to happen in the right way and how do we improve mm -hmm. efficiency especially for renters mm -hmm. yeah and that that is absolutely a value i just want to make sure that as we as a city consider building a program like that that we think beyond uh shaming the landlords by giving them a bad score that we think towards more uh carrot options and not just relying on the stick of shame of of getting a bad score uh for these landlords well and that is something that comes up and you know we've had discussions with communities that have done this kind of thing and in some cases it may be um you know voluntary participation it wouldn't necessarily be um they wouldn't be obligated it wouldn't be mandatory i mean again these are just options we're pursuing so there's no we haven't come up with a final solution as to what we want to do and how we want to do it but that yeah. is certainly one of the concerns there's no question that's come up as a concern thank you so much you're welcome no get your hand up this um this is really an, an interesting project um, it was introduced uh, by chris as building energy disclosure and i'm just wondering if there's any part of what you're doing that would require building owners to disclose how much energy was used in the building. So I guess, you know, where our conversation started at the beginning was really um, looking at creating a policy that required building efficiency disclosure, like having a building efficiency disclosure bylaw. Um, or and then it sort of changed from bylaw to maybe a policy, <laughs> and then it sort of came to maybe we have a program. You know, it's so it's kind of evolved into, um, you know, the the challenge that we all face. You know, is how do we, how do we get the information that we think we need, and how do we, um, how do we get landlords to report and building owners to report, and how do we incentivize that, and how do we you know, do this in a way where it doesn't feel like a stick. Um, so, you know, if we go the route of a bylaw, then it's going to be a requirement. If we go the way of a policy, then it's could be more of a voluntary effort. 
And we, those are things that just haven't been, we haven't even gotten that far, honestly. Right now, we're just trying to examine all of the possibilities. But the goal, you know, ultimately, the goal was really, at the beginning, was to create a, um, a building disclosure bylaw. So um, as you probably know, um, Boston and Cambridge have um, uh, created ordinances uh, that require building owners to report their energy use. And um, my understanding is that the current climate bill that's, that was passed in the House today and is currently, as we speak, probably being voted on in the Senate, um, includes a provision that would be true statewide um, requiring all buildings over 20,000 square feet um, to report their energy use every year. So I, I don't know whether that applies to any buildings in, in Amherst or Northampton, but it's an interesting thought. Yeah, and I would say that um, my emails have been very active today because of this legislation, um, because the group, you know, the an advocacy group that we were involved in with this RMA effort, um, a lot of those folks are the ones who are sort of behind supporting and advocating for uh, this legislation. So, well, Stephanie, I think um, <clears throat> we're kind of running out of the time time period that we had slated for. It. Thank you very much. I mean, I would say, uh, actually, Rachel might have a question here, but I, I do want to comment though that I'll, I suspect because of your registration process, rental registration process, you actually know who your landlords are. Yes. Better than we do. Um, you probably even know what properties are rental properties more than we do. So um, I'll say, you know, just the data about that makes planning to reach out to them. That's an audience that we, it's a little opaque to us. Mm -hmm. um, so this, um, I, I think it helps to kind of understand who the audience is, what's the makeup of the audience. Right, and the rental registration program uh, originated through the um, from the the building commissioner and the building inspections department. So, you know, that's really where that came from, and it was in part create in part created as also you know um, you know a, a revenue generating resource as well as you know giving the town the opportunity to have that information and data. So that we have so many rental units and so many students that it was really, um, you know, in response to some of the challenges that we'd faced as a community. And so um, this was the town's approach to sort of really try to get the reins on that. All right. Rachel, did you have a question? Yeah, just before, uh, before we lose Stephanie, I wanted to thank her. This, you know, this kind of information sharing, I think we just really need to be doing all the time because it speeds everything up and you're not reinventing the wheel. So thank you for your good work. And if you are the, I, I've only heard a little bit about the universal composting going on in Amherst, but if you would, if that's something you're involved with, I would love to have you come back because our plastics ban goes into effect in October and that's going to be a big part of it, the composting issue. So is, is that something that you're working on? Not to get off subject, but I just want to know if I should contact yeah. you later. I'm not, but you could contact okay. me to find out who you should contact or Chris okay. can Good. either either Great. way. Because it sounds like <laughs> Chris is doing so many fabulous things and that was one that caught my eye as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Sure. And I want to thank you all too, because as much as we're inspired, you know, you might be inspired by this effort, we are equally engaged with the work that Northampton's doing. And I feel like we've had a really lovely collaborative dynamic and I feel like we've been learning from each other and I know you know Chris and Carolyn to me are colleagues that I look to a lot and Adele you know as an advocate I feel like I've worked with Adele now quite for quite some time so I feel like it's a mutual thing thank you okay any other last minute real quick going going gone okay thank you very much stephanie you're welcome you to join all. us for the rest of the meeting if you want or go out and enjoy the thunderstorm i appreciate <laughs> it but i think i'm gonna go <laughs> okay very good all right so carolyn i guess we um we need to come up with a new meeting time um that would be helpful for me because on the fourth Thursdays, um, 
I sometimes have a conflict at 4.30, from 4.30 to 5.30, and it's not consistent. So I don't know if this time of the afternoon is best for everyone or if it could be shifted up a little bit earlier or if that doesn't work, you know, and maybe it's gonna take a few rounds of um, calendaring to figure that out. Um, right, another, another it's on the, it's, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was gonna say, you know, along with a, an initial conversation here, maybe something will pop out, but it might lead to like um, a when to when to meet or a doodle poll or something like that to find something yeah. else. Yeah. I mean, the alternative could be same time, but not the fourth Thursday, maybe the third Thursday or whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's actually for me, the conflict would be on the second or fourth Thursdays. Otherwise, I don't have a standing potential conflict. Any comments from anybody? Uh, does it have to be Thursday? It, no, I think it like we were confined to Thursday, and I'm wondering why. I suspect it was because we have historically met on Thursday, and so that kind of probably means Thursdays are okay for commissioners. Yeah, well, it's actually never been okay for me, which is why in the fall semester I'm always late. So if it suddenly works out that a non-Thursday works for people, that would probably work better for me. I would say the day of the week doesn't matter to me so much, but the time is important that it not be earlier during the day um, for my work schedule. I mean, that um, <clears throat> this time slot is fine for me on, any other day as well. Um, so I'm not necessarily wedded to Thursdays either. Sounds like maybe a when to meet or something. Yeah, yeah, should I do a when to meet, basically say four to six and we'll have an option on, you know, tell us which day of the week, which, which month, I mean, which week of the month <laughs> works for folks. And we'll see if something pops out. Okay, I shall do that. So our, 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 our chair can join us at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yay. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, okay, so the, um, actually, do you want me to take the next one, Carolyn, as well? Sure, that would be great, thanks. Great. All right, um, uh, NESC membership. Um, uh, she's not here, but I'm going to make an announcement on her behalf is that we are losing Ashley. Ashley is going to be stepping off the, off the commission. So just want to let everybody know, get the word out there. We do need another member at large. If Ashley was here, I would be thanking her for her service. That's for sure. But I've been told that she's, um, she's going to be stepping off. So, okay. I guess there's not, not really much to say about that. Um, just announcement. If she was here, there might be a few things to say about it. Um, all right. Um, yeah, and, I'll, and Carolyn, I'll, if you don't mind, I mean, I, I think I'll just take a next couple of, right, because. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're not totally looped into everything the commission has got lined up. Right. So, right. Right. Uh, okay, so the, um, this next item, just to explain it to you, Carolyn, is uh, the, the commission asked to be given a heads up in enough advance notice so that they could have an input in any kind of um, project initiative, regulation, policy change, et cetera. Um, and so we did form a, a document to kind of keep track of any new, doc, any, any new um, uh, things coming down the pike. And that actually has kind of shifted to a document that is keeping track the status of, uh, of different projects. Um, uh, it seems almost that that's kind of where it's come to. Um, it was included in your handout. I updated that so you can see some status updates in there if people want to look at it. I don't, don't think we needed to go through any of it. It's just to give you an opportunity to know where we stand. Um, uh, it wasn't that document was never conceived of as being a status document, but maybe we'll make it 
Maybe we'll shift it to that way because that seems to be naturally where it's going. Um, I will give everybody a moment here, um, uh, Rich, Louie, um, Carolyn, uh, you know, is there a new project coming up, uh, project initiative regulation that the commission should know about that we, you know, just a chance to bring something up right now? Um, can I ask what you define as project? Is this a city project or is it any sort of major development that might be happening or um, how um, framed? My understanding is that it's, it's, it's really been something that this commission can have an input into. So, you know, we probably don't have an input into a private development, but we might have an input into how zoning works on something or... So it's basically if this commission might be able to provide some input and have some say in something, then that, that's what it would be. Um, well, I, I did see on the list of um, things that were in status, uh, you know, as sort of underway. Um, and I know you all reviewed, sort of looked at, um, a draft of the lighting ordinance, I believe, a few time, a few meetings ago. That hasn't really progressed. We're still working on that internally, but we've had some comments and feedback on that and comments. So that's, um, you know, that I think you guys looked at that and it'll move forward to the, in a standard way to city council and that, and that um, process for um, public, public, um, hearings and feedback through the normal sort of legislative process. Um, and I'm just trying to see if there were, um, you know, other things from that list that I might have information about. Um, I don't think I really see anything in terms of policy and zoning that would affect the energy commission at this point. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to you, uh, Carolyn, on, on, on how to get a link into this. And so you can keep it updated if you want to. What I tend to do is look at it before each NESC meeting, um, mm -hmm. just kind of update it in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And then okay. it's just available because the commissioners can, can go up there and look at it anytime they want to. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Then actually moving on to the next agenda item, following up from previous meetings, uh, follow-up action table. that. Yeah, you know, Carolyn, for your information, this was just the commissioners sometimes felt that uh, something would be discussed, something was be asked for, um, and then they felt like, well, they never heard from that again. So this was, this is a table where we just keep track of um, anything that was, uh, and basically any action item that came out of a meeting, a discussion, um, <clears throat> so that commissioners can see what happens. Uh, so last time, we had a presentation of Smith College. Um, it was, uh, everybody agreed that it would be great to do a, um, a field trip to uh, see their geothermal system being produced. So I've reached out to Smith College, let you know they may uh, wanna set something up mid-August when a test well is being drilled. Um, so that's a heads up. Um, other than that, um, uh, Wayne was gonna send something out on land use and green buildings. He did, I'd say that's complete. And um, Ben um, uh, had some input to a design that we're doing at Leeds School. And well, he's been quite involved with that at this point uh, that stemmed from that conversation. So that's your follow up on that. Um, uh, Carol, I'm gonna suggest that we actually take the high impact projects and move that to the uh, end of the discussion because it's kind of open-ended. I think it's okay. probably better. No that makes sense. Yep. yep. Next one, we have submitting comments on the draft stretch energy code. Just real quickly, um, as folks know, the stretch energy, new stretch energy, draft stretch energy code and this opt-in specialized stretch energy code are out for comments. Um, July 22nd, that's tomorrow, there's gonna to be a public hearing at in, um, in Westboro, Mass. On August 2nd, there'll be one in Quincy. There's none in Western Mass. There's a virtual one on August 8th. And then on August 12th, by 5 p.m., the DOER would like to have all public comments submitted. 
Um, so I'm kind of assuming that some folks here are interested in um, uh, providing comments on the stretch energy code. And I didn't have anything specific to present. Last minute, Adele provided some, she's been working on a draft letter that could be something that comes from the Energy Commission. This meeting right now is the only chance we would have to actually say, as a commission, we wanna have a voice here. Certainly any individuals can, um, that's for sure. Um, so um, I can bring up Adele's uh, draft letter and share the screen so everybody can see it. It was sent to you just last minute before this meeting started. But before I do, does anybody else have suggestions? Is it, has anybody else got um, a list of things they want to um, uh, send off to the DOER regarding the stretch energy codes? Nothing coming up. Well, one, why don't we share Adele's letter? And that's something we can um, get feedback off of or we can respond to. Um, ba -dum -ba -dum -ba. I thought I had it here. There is a major error in it. Okay. <laughs> I. <laughs> In the second paragraph, the first sentence, oh. it says uh, the June release. <laughs> it was actually February. The, the The current one was released in June, but the previous one was released in February. <laughs> okay. Um, Adele, do you want to walk us through this? Sure, I'm happy to. You know, this is a really complicated subject. And I've done my best, but you know I'm sure that some of you could do a lot better. Um, and I have access to a network of very highly um, in, informed and um, uh, expert people. So, uh, so I've taken a lot of their um, ideas uh, in this letter. Um, but this letter only pertains to the specialized municipal opt-in net zero stretch code. Um, it, you know, they've released three draft codes, base code, stretch code, and then this special municipal opt-in net zero stretch code. So uh, that's, that's what I've commented on. And uh, so, you know, as you can see, the letter starts out by thanking them for the changes that they did make, which, which were great. And, and by the way, I, I didn't mention it here, but, uh, there's a basically a 20% energy efficiency improvement in residential and way more than that in commercial um, in these new codes. So, so it's really, you know, it's a lot of benefits here. Um, but uh, from our point of view, as you know, Northampton is one of the communities that has a gas moratorium. And we, we you know, uh, I personally hate it when I see propane tanks being installed. And so, uh, so what I was looking for in this new uh, specialized stretch code is uh, an option um, for uh, fossil fuel free buildings. And there is no such option in the code, which is why um, the longest of my the comments in this proposed letter is about that. And uh, it is asking them to consider, um, in fact, adding, changing the provision, because both, both of the provisions included um, in this new specialized stretch code um, include a fossil fuel pathway. And uh, you know that that means that builders can, can keep putting in propane tanks without any without, without having to justify it. So, um, so that's that's the basis for my comment. Uh, the comment number one. And um, if you can uh, page down, and, and in fact, um, the attorney general has weighed into the subject, oh, sorry, um, because uh, I guess DOER was saying, oh, you can't require that. Um, but in fact, you can. If it's an opt-in code, um, you can actually require them to uh, require all electric buildings. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether you all will agree with me, but uh, that's certainly something that I personally feel strongly about. And if you do too, 
uh, then you might want to uh, include this sort of a comment. Uh, and yeah. what, what this new special net zero stretch code uh, does is require for, uh, for buildings that are fossil fueled, um, it requires them to have electrical conduit installed so that eventually the buildings can be become all electric. And, um, you know, to, to my way of thinking, that's just building in more expense. So that's, um, uh, you know, to, to retrofit a building during its useful lifespan. Uh, because it has to meet these new standards that are going to kick in later on, later on just seems crazy to me uh, because it, it, it adds expense to both the building and later on when you have to rip out the propane tanks and uh, uh, add heat pumps, etc. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, so so that's that's number one point. And I don't know how you want to do this. Uh, Chris or Car Carolyn, if you want to go through point by point or cover the whole letter first. You know, I think I think Adela kind of makes sense to take a point by point and see what kind of response back because so Adela's started drafting this. I'd be happy to finish this up if we have the, you know, on the points that the commission agreed to um, and send it off on behalf of the commission. Um, so uh, to, to this first point. I mean, maybe you can just say, if there's no objections, we'll just include it. Okay, no one's- I think it makes out. sense. I think it's, I think it's in, Adele. <laughs> That's great. No, no objections. <laughs> um, to me, it's the most important point. And, um, and then the second point is, uh, you know, that there are certain, this the draft code requires on-site solar generation only for some buildings like for example the ones that are fossil that are run by fossil fuel combustion and that just doesn't make any sense to me um it makes sense to me to require on-site solar production um for all new buildings um wherever it's feasible so that was the basis for point number two Any what does it mean? Questions? Oh yeah, what does it mean where feasible? Well, if if there's if it's not shaded, if the roof isn't shaded or you know there aren't some constraints on the site. I, I can't actually recall all the stipulations that make that qualify for something to be not feasible, but uh, there's more than just shading. Um, it also has to do with the geography of the site, et cetera. Then uh, yeah, I'm just, I know that this question has come up before about how much shading and does it make it financially viable um, or um, do you get enough re essentially return? So it might not be completely shaded, but it still might not be um, feasible. So I, I, I mean, I think it's a great concept. I think it would be, I'd be concerned about the definition of um, feasibility. Well, DOER has their own definition, and I'm assuming that that's what would be used. And it is very, it's along the lines that you're speaking of. Um, okay. Uh, and I, and, you know, we could pull up the actual draft and see what it, what they actually say. But I think Ben has a comment. Well, it's obviously you know related to the same complexity of of you know in reality, if you're building on a particular site, what's feasible. Um, but the, the other thing is that it's not always, uh, it's not always that cost effective. And if, I mean, I guess if I had the, to choose between, um, promoting more affordable housing and, and getting a few more rooftops with solar, I, you know, if that was going to be the, the, the difference maker, I would want a way to opt out of the solar because, it, the most expensive way to do it is rooftop, uh, you know, di distributed rooftop. It, I, I wish that weren't true, but it is at least for now. So I guess I'm I'm hesitant to lock in something that limits choices and therefore could raise prices or make 
you know, just make be some sort of limiter. I, I could see something more like what California has, which is a solar ready. So essentially, if the site is appropriate, there are constraints on design so that design has to be able to take solar. You have to have the electric, the, the electrical service capable of it, all those things that allow the consumer or the, the homeowner or the, the building owner to do solar later. Um, anyway, that's my thought. Okay, so it looks like this one's not a slam dunk. No. Louis. I'd agree with Ben in the sense that I'm really afraid that um, we're creating um, a single family house code that prices, that adds enough to the cost of a single family home. Um, I'm thinking about $25,000 worth of solar on the roof that has a 10 or 12 year payback that, that um, we should be looking at um, not so much a requirement um, as a way to incentivize the, uh, especially for low income or potentially low income or, or less expensive um, housing. Um, current code has the solar ready provisions built into it. Solar isn't something that where you have to pull something off and replace it with solar panels. You can add them later at some point. And following code, it's not a very difficult process to do. But I think uh, uh, cost is, and cost to the actual ultimate resident is uh, something we need to pay attention to. Um, some, of the, some of the larger scale projects um, seem to have um, some good support but um, on a one family, two family, um, small development basis, um, it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. Um, Gordon? You're muted, Gordon. Are you there, Gordon? Your hand is raised, but we can't see your face and you're muted. Um, oh, there we go. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry about that. My uh, glitching up here. Uh, I just, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Just wanted to disagree a little bit with my colleagues. I think that our, the lowest point of the lowest cost point for installing solar is going to be at initial construction. The idea that any low income people can afford to build a new house right now is almost laughable. Um, there are no, no low income people building new houses. The cost per square foot is astonishing, even with, uh, even with current building codes. So the idea that solar panels would be the cause for someone to not be able to afford to build a new house right now, uh, I, I think is somewhat detached from the reality of the building market. And the, 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 again, the most cost-effective time to put your solar panels in is when you construct the building and you can take, you're, you're already going to be taking out a 30-year loan on the house. So the cost of the solar panels is going to pay for itself over the cost of your loan uh, by twofold. And, uh, and it would reduce the operating costs of the building significantly over time. So uh, I, would, I just want to disagree with, with uh, the other people on here. I, I think that requiring solar is a good thing for new buildings. The other, the other point to emphasize is that the, the way the code is written right now, uh, it does require solar for fossil fueled homes. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know where that falls in the cost spectrum, but it's important to know. So just um, because we won't have enough time to 
try to come to any kind of conclusion here, I would say just the fact that there are different periods, we just take this piece out of the letter um, at the moment. And uh, let's go on to your next point, Adele. Uh, so for some reason that's unexplained, they've omitted the portions of the code um, that uh, applied to uh, embodied carbon. And so we're just asking them to put them back in so that um, the, the requirement that cost-effective low carbon materials be used in construction be reinserted uh, into the code. Anybody have a response? No, I, I have a thought um, about this one. So first of all, I like that idea. And the great thing is if there were enough places that opt into this, that creates a market for labeling of the carbon uh, content of, of materials. However, that, that market is not particularly strong now. And so my question is, what would that do to the builder who is not a life cycle analyst and just wants to go down, you know, just wants to, to buy, buy their materials and, and build something? Um, and I'm not, I, I guess my question is, are there resources to help people make that decision? Um, and, you, you know, or, or is, is that something that would be provided? In other words, it, that that's just that's my my concern is is how do you do that without just becoming an unfunded mandate on people to do all this research? Yeah, I guess it, it partly depends on what they're asking. Yeah, right. I mean, how broadly does this go? Is it, are they basically saying you should use a, um, a you know a low greenhouse gas emission spray foam? Um, pretty straightforward. They're labeled, but well, embodied carbon. Uh, it, you know, usually means in the process of, of building the material, you know, extraction from the ground or whatever, processing, right. transportation, the entire life cycle. That's usually what's meant by embodied carbon. Right. Um, it, sometimes what people mean it is actually um, uh, sequestered carbon. So, you know, cellulose <laughs> or, or wood sequestering carbon. Um, and in a certain sense, that's easy. To, to measure because it's just by mass, you know, that's not that hard. Um, so I guess I love the, let's here's the thing. I love the idea and I want there to be a market for that type of labeling on materials. And this would be a great way to start that market. I feel like DOER would somehow have to support the initial phase of that market as it started going or provide guidance that, you know, a, a a, um, a, a prescriptive path approach or something like that. Interesting. I don't know uh, what that what the market forces are right now. Um, so are you are you saying that you would like to eliminate this um, in the absence of uh, there being a labeling program? I mean, no, right? Because I just said how I want it. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if the reason they were omitted was for a reason similar to what I just described. So, uh, I mean, we can urge it and that makes them have to think about it again. And unless someone disagrees with the underlying principle under it, then I think we should keep it, <laughs> I guess. Right, they, if, if it's based on the fact that they simply, you know, builders will not be able to find products and builders would be up in arms about this, they won't include it, one would assume so. So urge it, just to modify the language a little bit on that one. Okay. Yep. Um, so right now it requires after the municipalities vote to adopt the municipal opt-in net zero specialized stretch code there, uh, it's required that they give a six month notice. And um, we have some people who are thinking that that's really too long of a time because everybody knows this is coming down. So uh, why, why wait six months to actually adopt 
put put the uh, put the new code into practice. Louis? I mean, I think it's it's mostly the planning of a project. I mean, there's a project on Bridge Road that's been it's been in the planning stages since I mean, you could say 2011 um, to code change after code change multifamily. But if um, the building code traditionally has a, a, a basically a six month concurrency doesn't mean you can't start under the new code. Um, and it's been that way for quite a while because of the, the lead time for planning a project. So the question that I would have is uh, when when a project gets permitted, surely it must specify what 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 you know exactly what it's going which code it's going to follow. So uh, in any case, it looks like Carolyn wants to say something. I, I was actually just going to say most of what Louis just said is that. Um, a, the projects are planned, um, you know, well in advance. And B, I don't know that everybody is aware that this is happening and it's coming down the pike. Um, not that we couldn't do big public outreach about it, but um, I think um, that it really is a matter of um, timing and planning and 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 for for expense purposes and. Um, you know, acquisition of, of materials. So are you saying that when a, when somebody pulls a permit for a project, clearly they, I'm assuming that they have to have a, a they have to be in compliance with the code that exists then. So if there's a new code that comes into play after that's been permitted, the new code would not have to be followed. Is that I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that that, and I'm, I'm looking to you as the expert to, to answer that question. Go ahead, Lucy. Louis? Well, certainly once it's been permitted, the new code um, doesn't apply, but if the project had been in development for a year and a new code showed up a month before they submitted for a permit, there'd be a scramble to re- um, redesign whatever project there was to meet whatever the new code is, hence the six month or even one year concurrency that uh, building codes have used. Okay. So, so uh, it sounds like you want to eliminate this request. Sounds like it, yep. Or at least okay. debate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I thought it was also partly so I, I mean, I, I believe that the codes go into effect either in January or June, right? July, right. July, okay, good, yeah. So it just kind of neatens things up that way too. So you don't have it implemented in May in some towns and in February in other towns. So yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll take this one out of the letter. Okay. Uh, so the uh, the DOER cost studies, um, you know, don't include the current prices, and it seems seems to uh, most of us that they really ought to redo their calculations based on the uh, the new costs of building. Um, so that you know, it may very well make um, the fossil fuel costs look a lot worse. <laughs> Because the costs of fossil fuels are going up, 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 and the the price of renewable energy, solar panels, are going down, down, down. So um, it seems reasonable to for them to up to ask them to update their cost studies. I can understand why you're asking that. I will say, that my understanding at the moment is that electricity costs actually have gone up a lot faster than gas prices have at the moment. If they look at it at the moment, it may an electrified house, an electric house might actually look less cost effective. Unless it has solar. Unless it has solar. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, this is but, a dangerous game to get into. Right. <laughs> um, because like you just said that solar's gone down, down, down. Well, that uh, hasn't been true recently. Um, and of course, a building is 
depending on who's building it and how it's being financed is either a short-term or a long-term investment. And uh, fuel prices or energy prices in general are all over the place. And yeah, right now electricity is rising, but relative to the price of electricity over a very, very long time, it's relatively stable. Whereas most of the delivered fuels, especially wildly fluctuating up and down and the unpredictability has a cost. So, um, so, so I think it's actually, it would actually be reasonable to say they should use a price, but they shouldn't use just this year's price. They should use um, or either, like what I've started to do myself when I'm doing energy studies is I now give high, medium and low prices. I look over the last 15 years Mm. and I use uh, uh, the inflation adjusted prices. And yeah, don't get me started on inflation and the exclusion of, of fuel and, and food <laughs> in the price on the CPI, but you use inflation, inflation adjusted prices. And instead of saying, here's the one number for you, I say, there's, let's take a, a low, medium and high scenario for these prices and you see what you think the future is gonna be. And what I've seen generally is if you think gas prices are gonna go low and stay low, then that's going to look good to you. But if you think it, no matter what you think about electricity prices, whether it's the highest or the lowest price you've seen in the last 15 years, it's always kind of a pretty stable deal. And so I, I think it would be good to recommend that they start using a better estimate of prices. But again, my, my approach has been to give three scenarios. I'm not sure if that helps in this case here. Well, it's, it, yeah, it doesn't help. And I guess that's the problem is, is like, it, it's, it, it's about, they have these studies that tell them what's cost effective and what's not cost effective. But as Adele's pointing out, it could be different in any given year. Um, so since it's a long run problem, right? You don't build a house uh, in, you know, well, you don't build most houses in a month or two, but you can. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the idea that we would encourage them to come up with a long term price or set of price scenarios, you can even weight those scenarios, right? So it's like, you know, the, it, the 95th percentile likelihood that you're going to be in, in one of these other uh, scenarios, at least at least treats reality as, as unknown as it actually is. <laughs> you, do you have a suggestion for rewording number yeah. five? Um, let's see. Also include costs. Yeah, you don't need to do it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, let me let me give it some thought. And but then we can't yeah. all sign on to it if if we well, if we it's done afterwards. Well we can if we say we're going to agree with what you write, Ben. Huh. So, you know, these points, because we're going to, basically, I'm going to rewrite the letter anyhow. Okay. Um, so you're going to write a piece of it too. Um, this is just a draft that we're starting with. And the commission is going to just basically say, yes, we, these, these, these primary points are to be in the letter um, as edited by Chris and Ben. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that one's as edited by Ben. All right. And then uh, the, the last point is, uh, it's just, you know, there's a, there's a real lack of coordination between our state agencies. And, uh, uh, and so there's really no way to know whether this, this specialized stretch code is, is really gonna help us meet the 2025 and 2030 emissions goals. So uh, it just seems like a huge um, uh, absence uh, in, the, in, the propo in their proposal. Um, you know, they haven't even, they haven't told us whether or not they think that what they are proposing is adequate. Carolyn? I um, get you the chair though. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I don't know um, 
I mean, I think modeling would be great. I just, I don't know if it's even possible to understand, and, and I don't know the details of the code enough to know this, but um, given that we have so many existing buildings um, and this is only gonna affect major renovations or new buildings, I think um, there's so many other things that have to be done simultaneously. So um, instead of spend almost, instead of spending time building a model to see where this will go, it seems like it's important to say, get as far as we can go in this code, but know that we have to address this whole other side of it for the existing buildings that aren't going to be renovated in the next eight years or 15 years, and that we have to develop a, a whole host of other strategies to address that piece of it. So I, I guess I would just say, I'm not sure if we, you know, if requiring a model or is, you know, beneficial. Yeah, I, I would, I would say, um, I see, you're, I hear what you're saying, Carolyn, very much so. Uh, but I do believe the state has got the things, our greenhouse gas reductions, basically bucketed or, or what was the, uh, you know, the wedge um, yeah. uh, bit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is one of the wedges, you know, code reduction or code, but we could, if they do have that, we could say, how far does it get you along on that piece of it? You know, does this get us all the way? Is it only going to get us half of the way? And Dell, I think that's what you're looking for, right? Because if this only gets us a tenth of the way, then this is not a good enough code, <laughs> is what you, what you could be saying. Well, and, um, you know, I've heard that the projection is that there'll be about, you know, that there'll be an X amount of development occurring in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if this new development occurs according to this, this new code, um, how will that impact our emissions status? They don't say, but they haven't addressed it. I personally would be fine with leaving this in the letter because it can do no damage. <laughs> you know? I agree. That's true. Yep. We can only we can only ask. Okay, all right. They Thank can you. take the whole thing or leave it. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Adele. We need a motion and a second to um, uh, turn this into a NESC uh, drafted letter. Move to endorse the letter. Say, I'm sorry. Say again. Move to endorse the letter. Or second. Second. The internet's not has changed or modified as we discussed. Oh, right, good point. Okay. Just writing here. Okay, great. Um, roll call votes, Louis? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Marissa? Hi, Marissa. I wasn't, hi, hello. Um, I wasn't here for the whole discussion, so I'm going to abstain, but it looks great. Okay. Ben? Yes. Rich? Yes. Rachel? Yes. And Gordon? Yes. Thank you, Adele. Great. You're welcome. And if, yes, thank you, Adele. If anybody here hasn't had enough of this, at, at seven o'clock tonight, you can you can um, register to join in the MCAN letter writing workshop on this topic. So if, if if does anybody want the link? I can I can read off the link right now. I think oh. that was last night. Oh, that was last night. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm late. Okay. Um, However, it was recorded, so you could watch the recording, I bet. Great. Yeah, I saw something about the recording coming through, and I said, why is it recorded? It hasn't happened yet. Maybe there's two of them. <laughs> All right. Um, getting confused on, Caroline, we keep, you keep a track of the agenda. I think it's climate leaders right now. Um, this is a heads up that the DOER 
is coming up with a what they're calling a climate leaders. It's a, it's kind of like a uh, green communities program on steroids. Um, and they are looking for feedback. So I just was going to give people a, a quick overview of what this is about. Um, let me get to the right place and I will share screen. Um, Stop sharing for a minute. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Huh. Can, can it, so can everybody see the uh, basically the PowerPoint here? Hello? Yes. Okay, thank you. Great. All right, so um, um, this would be like an increased version of the Green Communities Act. Um, key requirements, uh, and it, I'll, I'll say my first glance at this is this would be a very easy lift for Northampton. Um, I have to say there's a piece of me that's almost dismayed by that because this is supposed to be the climate leaders, the big heavy lift, and it's, it's like, okay, <laughs> what is everybody else doing? Hopefully it's kind of an easy lift for everybody, but let's just go through it. So you must be an existing green community um, member, easy. Um, you must establish, maintain a local committee to advise, coordinate, and or lead clean energy and climate activities. Depending on how they phrase that, I would say that you know, the Energy Commission probably uh, fits that. Um, Maybe it would have to be tweaked. Maybe we would have to start something else. Maybe we would have to, oh, but I'm not sure, but, um, but probably so. Um, we would need to be uh, have MVP community status. Uh, Carolyn, can you confirm that we do, right? Yes. Yeah, right, okay. Um, we need to commit to municipal decarbonization by 2050. Done that. Formulate a roadmap for implementation. I could say that the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan is probably a roadmap. Um, yeah. But again, it's gonna depend on how they frame it. Um, have a, a zero EV, or a, I don't know why that, I don't know what the Z is in there for, zero emission EV, uh, EV first vehicle policy. We don't have that, but it's practice. As of this year, it really is practice inside the city government. Anybody who's buying a, a vehicle is really looking at EVs first of some kind. It'd be a great thing to turn into a policy. So city councilors, I think this would be a great policy to add um, that you know, anytime we buy a new vehicle, we consider an electric or a hybrid electric plug-in first. Um, and then adopt a specialized stretch energy code. I would be highly surprised if Northampton doesn't do that, but I think we're gonna do it anyhow. Um, and then we would have to demonstrate leadership in these three different categories. Um, and I'm gonna jump down here. Your three categories, clean energy and climate policy planning, community engagement, equity, um, considerations are required and clean transportation and mobility. And they're basically just saying pick one of each of these. And what they've done here is they're not defining what these are. They're, they've gone out there and they've, they've found what they think are really good programs that are already out there. Um, programs, uh, policies, whatever. Um, they're, so um, they're riding on the backs of what, what other people are doing. And they're just, they're saying that in order for you to be to, you know, a climate leader, you need to do one of each of these. Um, we have all of them. <laughs> right, exactly. We've, we've, we've got them already. Yes. Um, matter of fact, with the feedback, we may be able to suggest more, um, more examples. Um, another way they kind of looked at it here is, so, in, you know, instead of going above adopting as of right siting, establishing and maintaining a local community, um, instead of just an ex ex expedited permitting process, you know, of MVP community status, creating an energy reduction plan to reduce by 20% in five years, commit to decarbonize um, instead, plus implementation plan. And that actually gets, I think, beyond the CRRP, but that, that would, you know, that's something I think the city is going to be doing anyhow. Purchasing only fuel efficient vehicles turns into a, a, a electric vehicles first and then specialized stretch code. Um, 
So what they're asking for, I'm gonna scroll down to the end. Um, I can include this whole power, this in the minutes if you want. So their feedback, um, are the requirements too hard, too easy or just right? What should be tweaked? Um, are there other municipal clean energy climate actions we should consider? What tools would municipalities need to participate? Would your community consider participation? I think that's probably a yes. What have we thought, not thought of? Um, so like I said, this is all due by 5 p.m. August 5th. Uh, so <laughs> I'm open to hearing people's feedback, not just tonight, but over time. Um, my first glance at this, um, I have to say, are there best practice programs that include reducing waste? Because I didn't see waste in there any place. And are there best practice programs out there for promotion to communication, basically public communication on this? I didn't see that in here either. And be, I think those would be two good things. Um, under tools, I'll say every community is going to start needing to have a place where they're going to charge whole fleets of EVs. You know, right now we're putting in individual charging stations. You start bringing, you start buying buses or, you know, large fleets in you know, DPW and you're going to need a place to um, um, drive your vehicle and charge it overnight, some kind of a, a fleet charging station. That's going to be a huge investment. So what tools do we need to do something like that? So a few ideas just kind of came to me right away. Um, and I'll send these in. But um, I'll open it up for comments for a few minutes. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this right now. We're right? basically just informing you. But did anybody, any ideas pop out um, from anybody right now? And uh, yeah, Carolyn. Um, I didn't, um, you know, look in detail enough and, and as you were flipping through nor mm -hmm. um, in the slide deck. But um, I don't know if there's anything about the relationship of land use and transportation, because um, I think that is an important piece that sometimes get less left, gets left out. Um, so, um, I mean, this looks like it's mostly about clean transportation, but it doesn't much help if you're forced to take transportation for every trip that you need to make because you are separated from where you need to be going. Right. By other than walking and or biking. Right. Oh, by the way, one of these um, one of these good practices I can't remember which one is actually they, they pointed to Northampton. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's oh, Northampton cool. Urban Sustainable Growth Out Overlay District. So listed as an exemplar. <laughs> okay, great. I'll follow up with you if I need more details in, in providing feedback to them. Or you can just let me know if you're going to do it yourself. Um, Adele. Uh, I had a, a thought when I was reading this um, that it it would make a really good opportunity for this commission to evaluate how effective it's been and make a list of all the things it's accomplished that would that would be included in the application um, for this program of all the things it's accomplished over the last five years that wouldn't otherwise have happened and perhaps even include you know a list of what we would what this commission would like to accomplish in the future. Um, and I don't know whether that uh, uh, certainly that could not be done by August 5th, but uh, but August 5th is just for comments and then presumably the application process will be much later. Hey, yeah. uh, I have say someone else raised their hand. Rachel? Yeah, I was just going to concur with Adele. I think that sounds like a great idea. I think it would be really granting and it would help us make big, big decisions that are coming up about, you know, how we're going to um, how we're going to coordinate our climate um, initiatives um, in a multi-department way to make quick decisions as things uh, literally heat up. <laughs> You know, that kind of feeds into uh, the select high impact projects a little bit. Um, I'm sliding on agenda items, but is anybody interested in signing up to sign on for that? Or should we?
I'll leave I'm it. Sorry, for I missed it. Sign on for what? Uh, what um, uh, Adele was just suggesting. Um, evaluating what how, how oh. effective the commission has been and identifying where we want to go, basically. Mm. Or I'll, I'll leave that. We can we can let that be part of our discussion on um, high impact practices when we get to that, which will be soon. Um, okay, thank you. Um, that does that. Um, and Rachel, do you want to present now or, or after the high impact practices discussion? Ah. Well, my my internet. Oh, can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Yep. Okay. My internet's acting up. So why, maybe I should go now in case it gets worse. I don't know. Sure. Okay. Uh, luckily, we have Adele here who has uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting with this proposed ordinance. So I would like to, you know, kind of officially recognize Adele so that it, and so we could also Adele could answer question and make comments on this. And I also to apologize that I didn't get a draft of people a little sooner. So um, yeah. So I think you have it in your mailboxes, but let me pull mine up. Okay. Okay. You're gonna share? Great. Oh uh, well I can't I don't think I can as a non-host. Can you share or do you I think I've got okay. it. Okay. If you can't, you can make me have, yeah. Uh, wow, my eyes are full on. <laughs> That's off the section. Oh, here we go, up to the top. I think yeah. so, this yeah. It. This is it. Yes, I yeah. believe that is. And now let me know if that's the wrong, I believe this is our latest version. Um, so yeah, this is, um, a, this is a home rule petition. I think, I believe we've talked about it before, the, the you know, the fossil fuel free, free, fuel free in new construction, but also in major renovations. Um, and so this would, Go through the home rule um, petition process, which means that the mayor would have to be on board. The mayor, I believe, is on board in kind of the spirit that I, um, we really wanted to have this draft fine tuned before I handed it to her. Solicitor Seawald has gone over it and made comments and you know minor comments, and we've incorporated them or responded to them. So that's where we're at now. So I would really like to introduce this to council. I mean, first, first of all, uh, you know, get the mayor on board because she has to be for a petition and then introduce it to council and go through the council process because it's really like, a, it's a really long process. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of time for fine tuning actually later at the state level. And then when it, if, if it comes back, hopefully to us here. So I would love any comments. I mean, so the, you know, the backdrop is just obviously that we, um, this does tie into um, the, the state pen, you know, the state level actions. And that's actually a, a more motivation to get this going because really the more home rule petitions cities and municipalities put out there, the more pressure, it, frankly, it puts on the, on the state level to just pass something at the state level. Uh, so um, yeah, so I guess I'm looking for any comments. Let me just see if I wrote anything. Um, you know, a lot of communities, This so this is based on, uh, on legislation that our communities have already passed in as home rule petitions. Um, I believe Newton and Del, we could tell you which ones, um, but um, yeah. And let me just see it. Right. So, so yeah. I guess I'm just looking for you know comments. I was really trying to be mindful about home you know, existing homeowners and new construction. So, I believe let me look at my copy because I'm having trouble reading the shared copy. You know, I believe yeah. We, you know, we'd leave that 51% if you're doing 51%, you know, new um, renovation, then this would kick in. And of course there's exemptions. Uh, so I would love to hear any, any comments anyone has before I bring it to the mayor. What's your timeline, Rachel? I mean, can people give comments back over the next week or two or? Well, that's a good- Right away okay. or? Well, you know, yes in the sense that I'm committed to submitting this. And then so the council process will be going, you know, we'll have to go to subcommittees, legislative matters and council. So in that sense, but if I guess I would say if there's any blocking concerns, I would love to hear those now because uh, I really want to get this moving. It's such a lengthy process. Um, so yeah, so be times for, you know, more, you know, amendments and, and such. But if anyone has any kind of really big conceptual blocking concerns, I, I would prefer to hear those now. 
Um, can you just clarify, is this, if we do a home rule petition, it's only in effect, there's a timeline, right, that this would be in effect, like it's a, is it a pilot project or is this for uh, permanent? No, this is permanent. And, and okay. so that's kind of going at kind of parallel action at the state level. And so in fact, our home rule petitions act basically like advocacy pieces that nudge, because ideally what really happens is the state you know, passes, um, you know, passes similar ordinances because it's so much simpler than trying to appeal for a home, you know. So, right. so it's kind of a parallel process, but they're not. So this is, this would be a permanent, you know, ordinance if approved at the state level and city council here, it would be a, a permanent ordinance here in Northampton. Uh, you know, there's ways, you know, it is an interesting comment though, because you know, there's ways in which MGL, you know, mass general law interacts with, city ordinances. So I guess things can be impacted by what the state does and doesn't do that's similar. But at this point, that's what would happen. May I interject? Of course. Um, so there are currently at least 10 home rule petitions that this is that th this one is based up upon. Um, and and it has and of course the first step is um, after the municipal level, it goes to our representative, uh, Representative Sabajosa, who would then introduce it into the House. And then it goes to the uh, TUE committee, uh, Telecommunications, um, Utilities and Energy. And then they sit on it for a really long time. And, um, you know, so, so these 10 home rule petitions that already exist, I've been sitting in TUE for um, almost two years. Um, and they're probably not going to act on them. Um, probably they're going to rule, you know, they're going to let, let them die. Um, be, in part because there's um, some state level legislation that would, uh, that would uh, eliminate the need for the home rule petitions. However, um, so, so the, the process is that it would have to be passed by the legislature in order for it to become permanent. Uh, it's so, um, uh, and as far as I know, you know, none of these on this particular topic have ever become permanent, uh, have ever been passed by the legislature. So, uh, but, but the hope is that if enough municipalities, just as Rachel said, if enough municipalities file similar home rule petitions, it sends a really big message to the legislature that municipalities want to do this. Yes, thank you so much, Adele. That's excellent. Certainly the intention, you know, would be, you know, my intention, Adele's intention, I'm sure, is that it would be permanent. But right, it's um, but yeah, the, the process is really um, yeah, it's a it's a long road. <laughs> And where is um, uh, uh, Senator Comerford's office on that? I like procedurally, can it go through the Senate first instead, or is that? That's a great question, Marissa, and I don't know the answer. That's, yeah. I don't know. I, I, know, I, think, I think all I, of our home petitions have gone through the House, but yeah. I don't know if it's necessary. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm uh, so, not sure. I, you know what? I'll, I'll look into it. I mean, it could be an either or kind of thing. I don't know that. I mean, I don't, doesn't. I don't know that it matters. Um, but I mean, it seems to me that the if this goes through and it's primarily sort of an aspirational kick in the pants um, to things that are already going, that would affect the Commonwealth statewide. Then it's it's certainly it's cer certainly worth doing and throwing ourselves into the conversation. Um, So I mean, so I think it's great. I just wondered procedurally if it had to go through the through the House first or the or could go through the Senate. And if anybody's talked to Joe's office to kind of know where they're at. I have not, I have talked to Lindsay, uh, I'm sorry, Rep Sabadosa. And um, and I think again, no one's seen this specific draft, I believe, but they but in spirit, you know, she's ready to uh, move it forward. And I believe Adele has talked to Rep Sabadosa, but not, yeah, because it always starts with the house, I hadn't thought to start with, with, with uh, Senator Summer. Right. Mm -hmm. 
the, my only um, thought, and this is a question that I've had, and I, Rachel, I know I've told you I, that I just want, I, I would, the the fifty one percent for renovation. I, I I guess I just wonder about that percentage, I, and it's, um, I don't have any reason to doubt it specifically, um, other than, I, I just, in terms of the like the burden on um, homeowners um, and things like that, what what percentage do we begin to create at what percentage do we begin to create is issues um, of affordability and equity for existing homeowners and you know senior citizens and folks who are um, might find themselves in a position where they have for whatever reason have to do some sort of major remodel that are going to be affected by that so I'm I'm really um, interested in that um, I sort of take a term but um, I'm I'm gen I'm gen generally um, very glad to put this forward and to um, but when we get into further discussions I think we'll be talking about that percentage and and uh, and what makes sense or I kind of also wonder well I don't know whether or not there needs to be a specific percentage or you know people are going to start tossing around arbitrary a lot <laughs> if we don't have a thoughtful um, basis for the number, but. Well, previous uh, versions that this is based upon uh, said 50%. And um, because of the kinds of concerns that you're mentioning, it was increased here in Northampton to 51%. <laughs> right, and I get that. And I guess I, I, um, I on my own, I, I'm gonna talk to some folks just to get some insight. Um, I assume this would go by the in front of the planning board too, and I know there's some folks with some expertise there that probably would have some useful insight into that. Um, I guess I just like one, you know, worry that you know, I don't know, there's a, a, a natural disaster and somebody has their house, you know, the roof taken out, and insurance is going to pay for it, and and you know, like what kinds of things begin to start start to trigger um, that kind of thing. But I really don't want to get in the weeds on this at this point. I, I'm excited about it. It seems to so, me so, also. I was, I was about to say, I think you have three people who are lined up to give you some feedback. Okay, by yeah. all means, there you go. I was this just using exactly, out loud, please feedback. Yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. I was hoping all three of those folks would weigh in. So I'm, thank you. Does anybody um, know who was first? Who raised your hand first? Gordon, no, you're going. No, it, okay, I'll go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I do think that that's great for us to get into the weeds a little bit. I think that at 51% uh, remodeling on a, any house, you're really talking about a very large uh, ticket renovation already. And I think that one thing I would warn us all about is assuming that the electrification choice is more expensive than the fossil fuel choice. And I think that there have been numerous occasions today in this meeting where I've heard people say that, oh, well, people can't afford to do what's ecologically correct. And I, I just want to, to challenge everybody to really think about that because I don't think it's actually true. Uh, heat pump systems with all of the rebates are probably the most cost-effective systems for anyone to put in. So I just want to say that if we're, we're making people do the right thing, it's not uh, necessarily going to be the most expensive thing for them either. It should actually be the cheapest. And long term, when we look at the effect on people's monthly budgets and we're concerned about equity and, and we, you know, the cost of utilities really piles up. If we're making people put solar on their buildings and eventually put storage in, it's ultimately going to lead to lower costs. Ben? Um, all right, so I, I think that, uh, first of all, on the new construction, obviously there's, there's no, no real conflict. So this is all about what to do with renovations. Um, and I just don't think square footage is the right aspect to look at. Um, so let's imagine a scenario where um, I have an existing uh, upper floor 
and I want to do some major renovations. In fact, what I want to do is I finally want to get the, the roof up to R80 because I just really want that. And I'm going to put in some really awesome windows and, and, and bump up the insulation on the walls. And I got to 51% of the gross floor area that's affected. But what I don't have in my budget right now is to update the heating system because it's smaller now and I barely need to do anything. I, I, you know, I just don't want to do anything with it. And you're telling me now I got to buy a whole new heating system because my old one is on natural gas. Now I want to, if I'm doing all this, I probably want to get there, but I may not want to get there in this one phase. So that's, that's just kind of the, an example where I think it's simpler to say, if you're going to be replacing an existing heating appliance, it has to use electricity, you know? And if you're going to be replacing an existing cooking appliance that, you know, it should, or, or hot water heating appliance, it should use electricity or solar thermal. Cause that, that doesn't really depend on the square footage of the building. And in fact, a really, really efficient building, uh, you know, this, that's large could have a large square footage and you, you could, you know, it kind of, there's just too many, too many things that get involved with using that in the denominator of the square footage. So I, I would su suggest maybe just taking out the percentage and, and going towards it, renovations that involve heating, cooling, cooking, and hot water heating should be electrified. <laughs> Um, I, I agree. I was going to say that I don't, that it is um, costly to add that other chunk of um, <laughs> a project into um, work that might not even have envisioned changing out a perfectly um, reliable system that's in place. So I won't add anything more to it because I, I was basically going to say that it, I didn't, I thought there was a problem with the percentage, although I know where the 50, I think I know where the 50% originated with, because that's used in other places in the, to trigger um, um, improvements elsewhere. So it's not a made up number. Once you go past 50%, it might be more thought, thought more of as made up, but I like your approach, Ben. Louis? Um, the building code has a whole book about a whole separate code about existing buildings with at least five ways to determine uh, substantial renovations based on one criteria, another criteria, yet another criteria. Um, I would hope that we could figure out a way that the idea that you need to upgrade a building to some degree or another based on the amount of work you're doing. Um, other, uh, um, other codes talk about the amount of money you're spending or literally the amount um, of foundation you're replacing to trigger requirements for upgrade. It's complicated. I'd, I'd try to stay away from some specific uh, percentage of building area and honestly don't know how you would incorporate what's uh, a complicated process of this, um, except that we could tie that specific section to fossil fuel uh, versus electricity on any sort of replaced equipment. Uh, again, go, echoing Ben, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to change out a perfectly functional elect, uh, fossil fuel heating system if, if all you're dealing with is um, replacing a roof that got blown off by a tornado. Marissa or Gordon, someone, Marissa, go ahead. Um, I wonder, um, and, and maybe the suggestion of, of sort of going away from the percentage um, and instead focusing on what the actual plans for the remodel are and whether or not they anticipate um, things that replacing things that could be electrified. Um, I, I wonder though, if there could be any um, ex basically exception for um, emergency renovations. Um, I, I uh, you know, growing up in, in, in Houston and uh, the number of times I've seen people's homes get flooded and things like that. And you get the insurance money that you get and you have to put a roof over your head. I, I, 
um, I, I guess I worry a little bit about it. I would hate for a natural disaster and in, in, in some circumstance like that to kind of trigger a wide scale situation where a lot of people found themselves sort of outstripped between what their insurance will give them and what they need and, and get kind of trapped in this. Um, I mean, my thought, you know, to, to Gordon's point is that hopefully in the context of something like that, that those renovations and the insurance companies, you know, would be making it possible for that to be an opportunity to upgrade, but that also, also people go months with tarps on their roofs um, <laughs> under if, if it goes badly. So um, if that seems appropriate to put in at this stage. Yeah, I would I would completely agree with with Marissa on that. I think that having an emergency provision is important, uh, and and uh, and people need to be able to get their heat back on quickly. Uh, and I completely agree with Ben that building square footage is probably not, it's it's an indirect way of going after something when we could go after it very directly and say that any fossil fuel consuming appliance has to be replaced with uh, an, electri uh, an electric consumption appliance uh, really just goes straight at the heart of what we're trying to do. Uh, and it makes it much less arbitrary for the, uh, for the building inspectors to have to figure something like that out if it's just clean and straightforward. Hey, Rachel, I think you got your feedback. I did. I, this has been invaluable. This is exactly what I was looking for. Thank you so much. So I might uh, reach out to you, you all individually about your points while I'm trying to amend, you know, uh, with, with Adele trying to re, uh, recraft parts of it. So I might reach out, but also please feel free if you have thoughts after this meeting to email me them uh, because we do have time to, to speak the language um, while this process long process goes on thank you so much everyone and and rachel just briefly um and I, I, I know you and adele have already put so much into this i'm i if i'm welcome to i'm happy to join on onto this oh yeah uh, I, and, like, uh, if there's anything i can help that so. would be awesome i love that thank you marissa yes i will marry you and yeah <laughs> and, um, <laughs> what are we talking about again and um so then but i do the point about you know that is you know there's a little irony in the emergency renovations because the climate emergency is going to force more of those. So I really appreciate that's a really crucial point. Right, right. Okay, um, as we move on, uh, Carolyn, I just wanna let you know what, what happened right there was uh, that there, the commission asked for some specific things in an agenda um, to go forward. And those include rotating reports from department heads. This time we didn't have any department head that hadn't gone recently that wanted to report. That's one of the few times. Rotating um, reports from the at-large members and then rotating reports from city councilors. And they actually, that actually kind of got missed for a while. This was the first time we've had from a city councilor. So that's what spurred on that and as part of this. And it was, you know, you see well, why it's- We might've been dodging it. I'm not sure if we got missed, Chris. <laughs> but then, then, <laughs> you got fortunate, no one, no one was pushing you. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I realized, oh, that's supposed to be on this agenda. And I've never asked. <laughs> Okay, but just- Great, thanks in, for that. Yeah, just filling yeah. in on where that was. Okay, okay. perfect. The so last piece we have then is um, an ongoing discussion on, um, Carolyn, to fill you in on, the commission has gone through all of the actions listed in the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan. And they looked at all of the sections, um, the action sections, and identified the ones that they, they prioritized the ones that they felt the Energy Commission could somehow be involved in. Um, and it's, um, I could share the screen with that again. I think I have that, yep, there we go. In, in this case, I don't know what you guys are seeing. Uh-oh, probably not full screen, here we go. Um, in this case, I've, I've, um, I've hidden the rows that didn't have a high priority one. So the green was the highest priority, yellow is the next level up down. And so it, it then goes into a conversation of, these are the ones that we don't say as high priorities. Um, what do we work on? What's, what's the commission gonna be 
picking to kind of um, take a, you know, grab the bull by the horns and try to get something, um, try to get something done. Um, I'm just going to, with that, I'm going to leave it open to the, open for conversation again. Does anybody have further ideas on where to go? <clears throat> I mean, I, we did hear from Stephanie um, earlier. Uh, we have, a, you know, an Energy 2A, encourage the real estate market to place greater value on building energy features, including deep energy retrofits and zero energy new buildings. Um, I believe energy disclosure is a part of that. Um, there's the cohort out there that's uh, working on this um, that I've been attending. Um, um, you know, it seems like that's one that it's a policy type piece that someone could take a hold of, but. I'll, I'll leave it up to, it's gotta be the commissioners who um, kind of come forward with some ideas. So Chris, I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I, I was really just gonna ask Chris if those two green ones were the only ones that were highlighted so far. Um, so we have the broad plan, going over it real quickly, you know, broad plan, um, uh, basically integrating all of the CRRP into um, the city and public schools processes. Um, uh, 1B, uh, Energy 1B is to procure more renewable energy projects on city property and through city partnerships. Um, I'm not sure how that was envisioned by someone to, to do this, but so Energy 2A, that's the encourage a real estate market to place greater value. Uh, energy 2B, expand programs for building electrification to convert from oil and natural gas heat to heat pumps or, or other electric sources. That one I could say, you know, we know we're gonna have this heat pump outreach program that's being paid for by the, um, um, by Eversource. Um, uh, so that's in the works. Um, uh, it could be as we roll that out, the Energy Commission could be heavily involved in that. Um, what have we got scrolling down? Require all new buildings are built to net zero energy standards and advocate for higher building code standards. Well, I think we're doing that. <laughs> There's what we've got. Right? Um, lower priority one, encourage resilience and regeneration building and site improvements. Okay, Energy 2F, accelerate community adoption of energy efficient and high performance building improvements with a focus on more equitable access. Um, I do see these kind of community outreach ones as being someplace that I think the Energy Commission could be um, quite active in some way, whether it's you know, establishing policies, um, helping the city with um, uh, outreach and education, um, just networking with the community in some ways, knowing where should we, you know, you know, how do we get involved in the community? Where, where are the leverage points and stuff? Um, I could see the commission being help, helping out in any of these kind of forward facing, community facing um, activities. Uh, 3A, oh, I scrolled past it, where we go. Adopt city open space management practices for soil carbon hey, storage. Hey, Chris, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. Can you tell us what you're looking for from us in this section? So I see us going through all of these things, but what, what, what do you want from us for this discussion? So it's not so much what I want. It's, um, I'll, you know, um, at, there, at one time when the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan was being formulated, you know, it came to the commission and there was a huge discussion on why are we spending so much time planning? We should do this better. Um, we should be, we need to be doing action. We need to be moving on things. We want to do stuff. Yeah. I mean, this huge amount came from you guys. And then what we dragged through the, you know, pulling out the climate resilience regeneration plan. I frankly think the NESC's input to that was essential. I think it was not really worth a lot before it got to us and written by consultants. And I don't think, I mean, I think it had huge holes in it. And I think you guys filled the holes. Um, I think it's a much, much better plan um, uh, because of that. Um, uh, but the you know all along in my mind was that you guys wanted to do stuff. 
Um, you wanted to get move stuff forward. And um, that's what we've done in the past. When the Sustainable Northampton Plan came out in 2008, the commission went through it. Well, actually in that case, the plan actually had the commission listed as a prime action you know, mover for a number of them. But we just went through them piece by piece and the commission said, okay, we're gonna take this piece, we're gonna take that piece, so we're gonna work on it. Louis, you, you remember that. So I'm not sure how else to, I mean, the commission, you can find other ways to be active and maybe you are finding all the ways you want to be active and that, that's good enough. But we have this roadmap and we have a commission. And so I'm just trying to find, it's not for me, but how do we, how does the commission help move things forward? Yeah. That's what so if, if, if I could just make a, a suggestion on this, um, the, the usefulness of this in helping to steer our future conversations is tremendous, as I think you just pointed out. And we have these rotating opportunities for uh, members of this commission to speak at length about a topic of their choice. And if we were to format those, um, those opportunities so that we were choosing the topics that are discussed from this list, in advance every week. So when we look at this, we say, okay, at next meeting, it is Ben's turn to speak. Ben, is there a topic on this list that you would like to pick off to help everyone here understand this item better? And, and maybe that could be coordinated uh, with a department head who talks about uh, that same thing on here and how they're implementing that with the city and or maybe that department head chooses a different thing on here to talk about how their department is is going after something on here and then this a city councilors moment to talk is also about something on this list so that every week we have a we are picking away at diving deeper into each of these sections and what they mean and what we can do as a city so that that is my two cents on this. Very good. So can I add add to that just a little bit? So I actually like the idea of well, you know, Chris sends out the email, hey, do you have anything to talk about this this time around? And this last time I didn't, so I didn't. Um, but that is a good way to guide what you actually think about. Um, and do I have anything to that I've learned that is useful for any any one of these topics. So I think that's a great approach. Um, you know, so I think the challenge for me when Chris, you're asking, well, what do you guys want to do? Is that we're not an affinity group or a, like a club. Um, you know, we're we're this advisory commission that serves a city. So it seems to me that we should focus on what what can we do that that uses the leverage that only the city has or that you know that basically that uses the city as the organizing uh, function you know we have uh the carolyn we have you we, we have um the uh, city councilors um and, and you know and so it's hard for me because a lot of this looks like volunteer, you know, like go out and volunteer to go and meet people and try to persuade them of things. And yeah. Perhaps. Um, I'll share that, um, you know, when the Energy Commission was first formed, um, it was based on the Parking Commission, quite frankly, because the Parking Commission seemed to work on, work well, and it had department heads and the city councilors and, um, and stuff. And I, I know that so, I mean, this might be just basically saying, Ben, you're right. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure here. But I know I've always felt, I personally, I come also, in, in, in that's where I'm coming from. I've been on the Montague Energy Committee for a long time. And I, small towns have energy committees, and they're very active. The people who are on there is because the town needs some extra help. And so um, they tend to do a lot of stuff. And I kind of thought that's who the at-large members would be on the Energy Commission. 
personally, whether it's written in the ordinance or not, that's kind of what I always pictured it as. Um, to an extent, you know, to some to some extent, they are. You know, they might write letters. Ben, you give advice. You know, give feedback and stuff on um, projects that we're working on, expertise. Um, uh, but anyhow, so uh, and no, it, and it doesn't have to be me saying pick something here and you guys be actives. And I also don't think the Energy Commission has to stay advisory if it doesn't want to. If it wants to become more active, it can. Um, I don't think there's anything holding it back. <clears throat> I think to follow up on that, I think those are good comments about sort of how to put this forward on the agenda. Maybe there'll be someone who will um, re-evaluate this list and then say, okay, I think this really should be the next nugget that we pick off and work on um, at the next meeting and, and have it as an agenda item. And if someone wants to take it as, you know, I want to figure out what the biennial plan is going to be or how start working on how we structure a biennial plan or whatever it is that's on, on these, you know, highlighted um, fields. Um, I guess the next question would be, how do we figure out who wants to be the one to suggest the next nugget for the next meeting? <laughs> um, and maybe that doesn't have to be figured out. Maybe that doesn't have to be figured out now. Maybe it could be figured out between now and the next meeting that we know that we want to have an agenda item that someone's going to say, you know what, this is really important to me. I think we should move this piece forward next. Um, don't know how to do it, but here are some thoughts and can we start sort of thinking in more detail about it? I think that's a good finish there, Carolyn. I mean, because we are out of time now. Um, yeah. And so instead of asking now, who's gonna take the next, you know, next month's um, jab at it, I guess I'll put out my, my typical request and we'll give this, give this a try. Um, Chris, there was, Pardon me, there was one more thing that I just wanted to address. At the last meeting, we had discussed forming a subcommittee on mowing practices in the city. And I believe myself and Rachel and Rich had volunteered to be on that subcommittee. What do we need to do to form that subcommittee? Hmm, I think just schedule a, a time to meet. <laughs> okay, we don't need to make a motion to form a subcommittee? Carolyn, I'll um, ask you if you know, if you have any insight on that. Did you all take a vote at the last meeting <coughs> about um, sort of agreeing that a subcommittee was fine and, and two, those two folks could be the subcommittee? I mean, I think it probably makes sense to officially as a energy commission say, yes, we're gonna now have this subcommittee on mowing yeah. um, and then the Gordon and Rich can be the committee subcommittee members. Um, know that if you're going to meet and you're officially a subcommittee, you have to post an agenda. Yep. Okay. Before, yeah. I 48 hours before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we can, we can do that. Okay. Why don't we, okay. um, someone want to move? Do this real quickly. Move, move to form a subcommittee on mowing. I'll second that. And um, okay, so we have roll call. And uh, does someone want a friendly amendment? Who's going to be in that subcommittee? So I'll make a friendly amendment sure. that Gordon and Rich will be the subcommittee. I thought there was a third. Oh. And Rachel. Oh, and Rachel. Sorry, Rachel. That's okay. <laughs> it's your internet connection. It's down. <laughs> right. Bye. Okay. Okay. Thank wonderful. You. Okay. Um, Louis. Yes. Marissa. Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Ben. Yes. Rachel. Yes. And Gordon. Yes. Okay, passed. All right. Thank you. you guys are anointed. Well, do we? Do you post it, Chris? Or? I can post. Yeah, if you guys come up with an agenda, send it okay. to me. I can post it for you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. All right. I think that's it. All right. All right. Thanks, Thank you. All right. Thank you. It's good to see everybody.
Welcome aboard, Bye -bye. Carolyn. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Great first meeting. Yeah. <laughs>